Welcome to the complete Overwatch 2 comp guide. The combined script length of this video is over 15,000 words, which is all backed by some of the best any pro coaches in the scene, including yours truly, so I can assure you both quantity and quality. If you personally or your team want help to improve, feel free to check out my coaching down below, and I've also included a fourth section on hybrid comps to help cover all my bases. By the way, for keen viewers of mine, this entire 90 or so minute guide is only a small part of a much bigger project. I plan on making the complete Overwatch guide. Every hero, every map, every comp, every concept, every macro idea, every micro hero usage, and even having the correct mentality all compiled into one massive guide. This is only the comp section, and my goal is to have that video completed by the end of the year, so stick around for that journey, and I hope you enjoy. Starting off with Tank, we'll use Reinhardt as the foundation. Brawl micro, like shield management, fire striking corners, tracking the enemy shatter, counter pinning, etc. are obvious staples, but shield management in particular is probably the most important one. Please do not waste shield early or use it while standing still. Most of the time you're going to use it to take space or to retreat back, and maybe interweaving your swings to minimise damage taken. In mirrors, so when you're playing against another brawl comp, Target priority becomes the main thing, aka swinging and fire striking onto the enemy Mei and not just the enemy Reinhardt. Also, utilise Cart for good shatters. I rewatched the entirety of London's play and run, and this was actually poured out by Hardy, utilising point in some kind of cheeky way to, well, get a cheeky shatter. This works because the point blocks LOS onto Hardy, meaning it's a lot harder to read and predict what he's gonna do. In terms of your role, it's pretty self-explanatory. Swing and walk onto wall targets, or back the fuck up and stabilise if you are the wall target. A lot of good Reinhardt play comes down to knowing your macro and matchups, so I recommend skipping to those sections. Now onto Mei. You'll see most brawl teams play with a Mei, and that's just because of the wall. Wall is one of the most important cooldowns in your comp, and I go over the many uses in my Mei guides. But just for now, you'll mainly see Mei wall used to get traditional splits and to push some kind of advantage, or you'll see it being used to block LOS from range threats like Arna's nade for example. Here's two bits of important micro though. Firstly, you need to be utilising some kind of cover to not get your ice block forced out early, especially in the mirror. If you're swinging or pushing an open space, you better at least be doing it with a shield. For example, in the flash up span final, Sugarfree's positioning is very questionable. For starters, he's ahead of his Sigma, meaning he can't even get shield to hold space, and he's also using a slither of cover, meaning his crow gets forced out early, and he just dies. This is the peak of NA by the way. Secondly, try and get walls that are flush with the map geometry to deny areas of cover. Credit to contenders coach Sage for this idea. For example, here in Flash Ops, Sam is hard playing the cover to the right side of Hawk, but Sugar Free walls behind Sam, eliminating that cover entirely and forcing out an early cryo. Unfortunately, Timeless still loses this fight because Sam just hits a crazy right click, but the point still stands. Also, while I'm at it, a little bit of micro here. Hawk should be rocking the Mei here after she gets walled, as the normal combo in the Sigma Brawl is wall, rock, and then amp speed in, and honestly, that probably would have killed Sam here. Bit unfortunate that he rocks the Ramatra. The complementary or even alternative flex DPS to Mei is Symmetra. I can't make this video without talking about her. The real value is primarily from the TP, and as you'll see with the many visual examples in the matchup and macro section, there are so many uses of TP. As a summary, you can use it to skip rotations or big sets of open space, set up crossfires, gain or clear high grounds, set up surprise windows or angles, rush onto a target or a group, flip the map, and more. Again, there's going to be a ton of visual examples showing this, so be sure to stick around. Obviously, I have to plug my coaching, you can get all of that in the link down below. Now onto the hitscan slot, which is mainly going to be Sojourn, but I'll talk about variations later in that section. And good news, this is really simple. You literally just flank when either team engages with their wall, and I actually wish there was more to it than this, but yeah. Here's an example from Pro Coach Commander X showing a prime example of this. And it's generally that you start with your team, and then once you have that rail, that's your ability to go and make a play. Now, of course, it's going to get rail. It's going to manage to get through on the flank unnoticed, charge up the last little bit, and connects onto Landon. Now, the reason this works so well, why Quartz has so much success with this is one, he hits the shot. If you're a hitscan player, hit the shots 
always going to help a lot. But also, his timing is perfect here. Because it's just as KSA walks, it means checkmate gets in this wall. They see this timing to walk forward, but that means all the attention is in this area, which allows Quartz a free opportunity. Now into Lucio. Thankfully, this is also pretty simple, especially if you've watched my Lucio guide, because the triple R playstyles still apply. As a reminder, the first R is the run it playstyle, meaning you're speeding your team to engage or run it down. You'll be trying to look for boops that make it easier to rush down the target. Like on Esperanza, this boop onto Hardy disables his ability to escape, causing his death. The second R is the relieve it playstyle. This is centered around relieving pressure off your team in some way, shape or form. This can be booping enemies away from your team, but also helping your DPS win and fight flanks, which relieves pressure off them. London did this pretty well against Atlanta Reign's Zive comp, where Admiral helped to relieve pressure off Backbone's Mei. The third R is Reddit. This is a legit playstyle where you draw squishies as the fight becomes devolved. Here's an example from a Grandmaster Ball team that I coached. So if you're gonna continue rush and go faster, what do we need to do? Maybe I should be over the other side of the wall. Yeah, um, right? Okay. Like, look at this. This is a nice pincer. Like, here, here. All right, that soldier's dead. And you got speed from Kutsune, so you don't need that, and shout too. You also could even help the Genji here, right? And then you can do some Reddit stuff, right? And then have a little bit of fun. The Kutsune rush itself is not the problem. The problem is how we approach it and how we set up for it. I think what's gonna happen is they're just gonna ski out. And then they've just cheated out your Kutsune rush for free. Because there's no follow up, right? There's no setup to this. Yeah, right? So yeah, this is as predictable as it could have been. The biggest idea to take away from Lucio is that these playstyles can overlap and they can also change throughout a fight. It's not like you just pick a one playstyle and that's all you do. I've got quite a few Grandmaster Lucio coaching sessions that explain that, so feel free to check those out on the top right, since I still want this video to be somewhat concise. And lastly, Baptiste. Arguably the simplest role in the comp, but one of the most mechanically demanding. There's not too much specific to the brawl comp for Baptiste, apart from one thing, and that's your window. In Flash Ops, we all saw the classic window roll gun combo, but in the Overwatch League, this was also common with Bastion Nade 2. This stuff needs coordination and planning ahead to do. There's also individual windows, where you take a separate angle for yourself, pop your window, and go ham. Again, I haven't got time to show that stuff in more detail, but there'll be links down below. Onto the macro. It changes depending on the matchup, but the very basic and broad theory is that your frontline, aka your tank and your Mei, will be applying frontline pressure with war cycles. At the same time, your other DPS will look to flank and get value, while your Lusu either helps with the frontline trade or on the flank. I'll talk about specific macro and win conditions in each of the comp matchup sections. As for broader macro, the most important bit has to be the push-pull, which I made an entire video dedicated to. I don't want to retread ground that's already been covered, so I'll summarise it here, but Jesus Christ, every coach that I know has always said that Rush or Brawl teams can actually play slow. So please, do not leave this video thinking that Brawl is just a W key comp. In essence, when we have these big alt fights, as said before, you can't just expect to pop a window, press W key, and win the fights. You certainly push when you do use an ultimate, but you have to pull in response to the enemy team's ultimates. And a lot of mistakes can be tracked back using the push-pull framework as you can see on screen, asking yourself whether you really needed to ult, how you could have gotten more value with the ults that you did use, and how to mitigate the value from the enemy team's ults. Generally speaking, if you're at an ultimate advantage, just play the long fights and you'll eventually win because you have more ults. If you're at an ult disadvantage, there's a few more options. You can look to bait or cheat ults from the enemy team early, you can play fast and catch someone off guard with like a cheeky shatter, or you can play slow and build ults throughout the fights as long as you're close to them and you know you're going to get them in the mid fights. I recommend watching the rest of my advanced concept guides to help build a wider macro understanding of the game. Another very key concept whenever you're playing any kind of brawl comp into something that's not a mirror is bunkering, aka utilising map geometry to hide your backline in places that reduce the amount of angles onto them and which can create dead zones. 
Mr. X brought this up on Blizzard World, where London rotated in such a position where the space behind them wasn't being used by the enemy team at all, creating a dead zone and making the angles in front of them much easier to absorb and deal with. This also applies to second point too, as well as the yellow point in Suravasa. Some additional examples would be on Ilios Ruins, where you can have your backline bunker near the catwalk to reduce the angles the dive can come from, and creating a dead zone behind you where nobody can come from, because it's literally just a wall. Against Vancouver Titans in the play-ins, Spitfire actually combined this idea with sim TPs, teleporting to and from adjacent sides of the points. London would have their Baptiste bunker underneath the windmill, or have him bunker by the mini. Here's another bunker example of Midtown Seconds, where because London is just in such a turtle position, it makes it way more predictable from when and where the Genji and the Queen are going to dive onto London. I'll talk about this more in the dive matchups. On Coliseo Attack, you can bunker underneath the bridge when playing against any form of dive instead of standing out in the open space. I spoke about how my team actually used this open space to set up a kill box and a web with three different angles from high grounds, but by bunkering underneath, you straight up remove one of the angles and you create a dead zone behind you. You can also get creative with maywalls and sim TPs as well. On Gibraltar, there's tons of spaces to bunker in, but a slightly unconventional one was seen here against the Shock's dive comp on first point attack, where again, you can see Sparker TP across the open space and then land the bunkers by the mini, where you can only get dough from two possible angles. Again, I'll mention this in the dive section, but you can also see Sparker TP duel and force out the enemy Sombra, as well as Backbone's Great Wall blocking off Renko from getting a clean nades. And lastly, on Antarctic Peninsula, you can see London bunker underneath the high grounds, creating a dead zone behind them. Even though London get constantly naded, because Outlaws are limited in terms of the angles they can take, they're clearly having a tough time getting any secure follow-up. This leads me onto the second major point, which is forcing points, which is what Hardy does here as well. Now, why you force points changes based on what comp you play against. Against mobile comps who often want many angles to stage a dive onto you, forcing point is used to slow down and disrupt that dive since someone has to contest points instead of diving. Against immobile comps who want to utilize their range, Forcing point is used to bring them closer, decreasing their range, and making it easier for you to rush them down, especially with sim TP. Mr. X had actually mentioned this on Suravasa, where Hardy can force points, Orisa drops, and then London can TP on the high ground, take a 5v4, and win the fight. By extension, that same idea used here about forcing points can also apply to the previous bunker examples on Ilios Ruins, Coliseo, Midtown, Gibraltar, and more. And depending on the map, you don't even have to use sim TP. A good Maywall can do just fine. So future Kajer here. I mentioned this in the Ryan section, but for the love of God and all that's mighty, please do not W key if you get a bad wall. The amount of times it happened in the Overwatch League is actually crazy. If you don't get a good wall cycle, fine. But at least disengage. Don't keep walking forwards. Here's an example from the Shanghai Dragons. Viper doesn't get a good wall off, so that's an obvious mistake. But he needs to realize this and SK the fuck out of there so SBG don't get value off their cooldown cycle and their May wall. Instead, he plays way too aggressively, allowing SBG to get value off their cooldowns, leading to Viper dying. Surprisingly, I assume Fletcher realized that he needed to play passive after Viper got a terrible wall because he didn't pop his nemesis. If Viper had just backed off and Shanghai rotated to points, this neutral fight could easily be won by them. Now onto variations. I'll split this up into each individual role and then list their pros and cons in relation to the other options, which should help you decide which hero stylistically fit for you. For Tank, the standard default has historically been Ryan, but there's two other main options, Ramatra and Sigma. Let's start with Ram. Credit to Spano for this advice back in late March last year. Ram's pros are his versatility compared to Reinhardt's. By virtue of having two different forms with different strengths, this is always going to be Ram's biggest bonus. Omnic form can be great for softening up the enemy Ryan before you actually go in and brawl. The second pro is really the pummels. They have more range than Ryan's wings, meaning it's easier to force the enemy make cooldowns from a safer distance, and they go through shields, and they technically have a higher DPS than Ryan's wings. The third pro is higher individual sustain. Block mitigating 75% of solo damage makes Ram's effective health upwards of 2000. The main con with Ramatra is that he has less team utility when compared to Reinhardt and Sigma. 
He can't block CC, and he's got a harder time blocking specific instances of damage, as Spyro says. Shatter is a big counter to Annihilation, and Ramatra has a really hard time marking enemy DPS on high grounds. The second con, and arguably this could be a pro, but Ramatra is very cyclical. He needs pretty much all of his abilities to do anything, and if you don't get value during your uptime, it's kind of Jova. Now onto Sigma. Sigma's main pro is obviously his range, the same logic applies to Ramatra for that pro. But really, it's actually marking that Sigma is really really good at. If a Sojin is on high ground with Relgon, or Ana Zen are lobbing utility into your team, Sigma has the range with his hyperspheres and his shield and his grasp even to zone that off entirely. The third pro has to be the CC. It's why a reset into Sigma is such a hard matchup because Accretion goes through Spearspin. Queen, Mauga, or Orisa get too close, Accretion is a guaranteed relief. The last pro is just how good Flux is. It's just so flexible, watch my Sigma guide for more on that. The main con to Sigma is of course the AoE, close range brawling capacity. Everyone knows that a good Winston Bubble or a Reinhardt swinging onto you, or even a smart Ramatra who can bait your rock can be really tough to deal with. And honestly, that's the main con of Sigma, but it's a pretty big one. Now onto Flex or Projectile DPS. This really just comes down to either Mei or Symmetra, because in almost every brawl comp, you'll at least see either of these heroes, if not both sometimes. I won't actually do a pros and cons list for either of them, because it really just comes down to what piece of utility, being the May wall or the Sim TP, that you need more. If you need to traverse big open spaces against comps that outmaneuver or outrange you, then Symmetra is probably a better fit than May. However, if the map is fairly linear, so it's easy to get good clean walls, and your TP is mainly limited to just TP bombing, then it's hard to go wrong with Mei. As a rule of thumb, you'll mostly see Symmetra used in non-mirrors, where you need to close the distance and rotate quite a lot to avoid staging or range threats. On Dorado, Gibraltar, Esperanza, Jungatown, and Havana, Symmetra is a must pick if you're gonna force brawl. And whenever you can play both, the win condition becomes getting your Symmetra to full charge beam before the enemy hitscan can get value. And if Sojin didn't exist, I think May Symmetra would be pretty strong. Now onto the main or hitscan DPS. Usually this is going to be the hero that's going to complement your Symmetra or May. The options are Sojin, Cassidy, Hanzo, Bastion, and Reaper. Let's start with the worst one, being Reaper. The only pro with the Reaper May is that maybe you have more chance to force out their May cryo first and it's maybe a better option against bad Winston teams, I just really don't know. Because without a Zarya bubble, your biggest con is that you just get forced out way too early and way too easily. I'll play an example from Flash Ops on the screen, so please, do not run Reaper May. Next up is Cassidy. Now I haven't seen May cast in a while, but the biggest pro with this is consistency. You're not relying on your Sojourn hitting that golden one shot, because each shot with Cassidy has the same value. Cassidy is also chonky. The HP buff, the damage reduction in roll, and in high noon, paired alongside the nade, means that when Cassidy's on the angle, it's gonna be pretty hard to actually kill him. The biggest drawback, however, has to be the lack of vertical mobility. All the other options have some form of vertical mobility to get to an angle that Cassidy just can't take. And unlike some of the other options, there is no one-shot or big burst of damage for your team to play around. Not to mention, High Noon is kinda bad, that goes without saying, but I still think people underestimate the value of a good Cassidy angle. Next up is Hanzo. The biggest pro has to be the one-shots. There's always that chance it's gonna happen, and you can see this very evidently in Atlanta Reigns matchup against the Spitfire during Pro-Am, where Lip just hits ridiculous shots and the fight is already over. The vertical mobility in War Climb is also much appreciated over Cassidy. Hanzo also has better flexibility, both in terms of his range, his greater burst damage, and his scouting potential with his Sonic Arrow. If you want to force rush on Dorado, Symmetra Hanzo isn't that bad of a DPS lineup. The biggest con with Hanzo is consistency. At least Sojin has the SMG, Bastion has a DMR, and Cassidy has a revolver. With Hanzo, you're gambling on the one-shots, so you really need to be mechanically proficient on the hero. The second con with Hanzo is that he struggles against Dive, specifically Sombra Tracer. He has no CC or burst mobility to either fight off or absorb the dive entirely. And the last noticeable con is that Dragon Strike is pretty bad though arguably it's better than High Noon. But ultimately, I have Bastion. Obviously, the biggest pro is the tart form uptime. Bastion form, plus Ramatra form, and a good May wall, 
that's going to be very hard to deal with. The sustain he gets in top form as well actually allows him to walk up on frontline, unlike Reaper, which makes him a lot more threatening against Winston-based comps. Biggest cons are a bad ultimate, he's a bad duelist without his turret form due to his hitbox, meaning it's going to be hard to get map control, and similar to Ramatra, you need to get value during a cycle. Good teams are just going to disengage after you pop turrets. And last but certainly not least, I have Sojourn. At least right now, Sojourn is probably the best DPS in the game along with Tracer. Sojourn has a hit scan one shot, she also has vertical and horizontal burst mobility, and she's the only hit scan DPS with an actually good ultimate. There's just no reason to not play her. The only downside is that if your Sojourn can't hit rails, you're gonna have a tough time. But Sojourn is basically broken, so if the only downside is that you have to be good, I think Sojourn's doing pretty well. Now onto main supports. Thankfully, 99% of the time, you're just going to play Lucio, but in some very few and rare cases, you might want to play Brig instead. This happened once in Flash Ops in EU, and it didn't go well, but I think that's mainly a skill issue rather than a comp issue. In short, Brig plays more to absorb and sustain through a dive, playing to pocket squishies, whereas Lucio is a lot more flexible in terms of him also enabling his tank. It's why SRP check or running Ramatra, because he gets a natural speed boost when he brawls, whereas Ryan doesn't. Now onto flex support, and again, pretty simple. 99% of the time, you're gonna be playing Baptiste, but in a few cases, you're gonna see Moira. The biggest pro with Moira is mobility, especially with Coalescence, which can be hard for certain teams to deal with. She's also easier to fight off enemy dive DPS due to her fade and sustain. Biggest con is obviously the utility. No immortality is a big one, but if you're playing on a map or against a comp where Baptiste Lamp is just going to prolong your death and not prevent it, Moira's not a terrible swap. You also lack range in both your healing and your damage, which is also another notable downside of Moira sadly. Okay, finally, onto the matchups. Onto the traditional dive matchup. This usually features either Winston or Doomfist, sometimes Wrecking Ball, but you know, I think we've all seen that util video. The DPS are high mobility, usually a mixture of Tracer, Sombra, Genji, Echo or Sojourn, and the backline is usually a Kiriko, Brig, and Lucio paired with Ana. The win condition of this comp into Brawl is simple. Leverage your added mobility to surround the Brawl comp as much as you can, then execute a dive onto a squishy target when they're ideally in open space. Afterwards, pull back, kite, and reset cooldowns, and then go for another dive engage. Comparatively, Brawl wants to disrupt that dive as much as possible. For keen viewers of mine, you'll already be familiar with the SPA framework, and when applied here, the Brawl comp wants to prevent the dive from even happening, then absorb the dive with sustained cooldowns, and rotate aggressively during dive's downtime and when they're kiting back. And there's a few clever things that you can do to help each one of those stages. In the prevent stage, you can physically place heroes like Mei on the same flank to match the enemy Tracer, Genji or Echo, and win that duel, or at the very least, waste their time. London did this against Atlanta on Ilya as well, as Mr. X pointed out, but also against Vancouver Titans, with Sparker pretty commonly catching out and out dueling He Sang on Echo, since he was by himself and on Antarctic Peninsula against Outlaws of Sombra Genji Kiriko, allowing them to win the first fights. They do it again here, where Admiral actually finds and jewels the Sombra, preventing the EMP dive, and straight up landing the kill on Happy. This is proactive play, and is something you need to consciously do. And again, I brought this up earlier, but that shock example on Gibraltar, where the Symmetra forces out and jewels the Sombra, and Backbone proactively warning and LOSing off Renko. The second thing you can do in the prevent stage is just use Sims TP to skip rotations and to skip open space. I briefly brought this up when analysing the 2021 Grand Finals, but if Atlanta had just run Symmetra, they can skip all the staging that Shanghai have in place. London did this against Atlanta in playoffs on Blizzard World Attack, using the Sim TP to skip rotations and scuff up the staging of Atlanta's dive. Remember what Atlanta want to do, they want multiple angles onto squishies moving in open space, but if you just remove the open space parts, that win condition becomes a lot harder to fulfil. Using Sim TP to disrupt the enemy dive setup is really, really important against the big ult combos like EMP, Nanoblade, or Minefields. On Antarctic Peninsula, you can see London rotate with TP above to the high ground to try and catch the enemy Arna off guards. 
Unfortunately, because Hardy is just a bit behind, and London still have to cross open space, they still lose the fight, but this idea of proactively taking charge, and not just sitting in one place, and getting dough from a big ult combo, is so important. You have to play disruptive against the MP, you cannot just sit still. In the absorb stage, the most important thing you can do is to bunker and create dead zones. I've already covered this idea in depth in the macro section, but in short, the reason why you bunker against dive is to reduce the angles they take, and to make the angles that they do take more predictable and thus easier to absorb. The second thing you can do is force points, which again, already covered in the macro section, but forcing point against dive forces somebody from the enemy team to come and contest you, ensuring that they don't get that three angle setup. Here's an example from a rank game, where Hardy forces point against the dive composition, again using SimTP to do so. This forces the dive to only have two angles of pressure, as well as forcing the Winston to touch and commit bubble, making the threat of the dive a lot less significant. The enemy team end up blading, but unfortunately, it's just too little too late. So there, you can see both points about SimTP disrupting the dive setup, and forcing points scuffing up the actual dive. Now onto the second matchup, Brawl Dive Hybrids. This is by far the broadest section, but this mainly encompasses the Orisa Genji, Junker Queen Genji, Zarya Genji or Reaper, Malga Genji or Reaper comps that are often paired with Lucio Bap, alongside some other hitscan, most commonly Sojin. This also includes the Winston or Doomfist 5-man composition, which is a Brawl Dive Hybrid too. Just a bit more on the divier side. Your win condition as the traditional Brawl comp is to straight up force a frontline fight. Keep the enemy tank, whether it's the Queen, Orisa, Mauga, Zarya, or Doomfist, as well as the enemy Reaper or Genji, at distance from your Baptiste. Utilize your shield to weather down the front line, survive the dive cycle, and then push back in. Their win condition is to somehow get their Genji or Reaper on top of your backline with a CD cycle. This can be Zarya bubbling Genji to go onto your Baptiste, or Queen shouting and then Genji engaging, or Arisa spear spinning in and brute forcing a dive onto your backline. With this in mind, how do we play to our win condition? Well the first way is through open space. Make it hard for the enemy team, specifically the enemy tank, to reach and dance on top of your backline. In Flash Ops Grand Finals, we can see this on King's O first point, where there is a huge clot of open space for Hawk to cross, which makes it hard for him to get on top of Blue Team's backline. I mean look at the damage he takes! He doesn't have a shield to walk up and close the distance. As a result, he gets his HP chunked, he gets walled off, and he dies. In Overwatch League, with London vs Shock on Mecha Base, you can see the amount of open space the Queen has to cross just to get on top of London's backline. Despite this, it's actually a smart TP by Backbone to set up a crossfire that ends up in Shock losing this fight. Since Shock's comp is still technically a brawl comp, I'll list 4 things Shock can do to help win this fight. Firstly, use an ultimate. Specifically, use an ultimate to make crossing the open space a lot more bearable. Sometimes this can be beat, for example, on Lee Jang Night Market, Boston beat rushed through open space on points, but it could easily be a Kitsune rush or a window. Secondly, force point with Genji Kiriko. This is something Shock later end up doing, and it forces London to either move or just give up the points. Thirdly, and this is a bit more map specific, but rotate the other side or just double back. Rotating the other side makes London's backline play closer, which is what Shock wants, so I don't know what Krusty was thinking going coast side. And lastly, split push. Send your Genji Kiriko, maybe Genji Lucio, underneath, and then send the rest of your team to go top. If London hold close, send your Genji through window, and the rest through main. If the Baptiste is bad and plays in open space, it's basically a free kill. There you go. Four solutions on screen that don't require a Symmetra or a Mei to close the distance. For the last example, it's going to be against the Orisa comp on Li Jiang. Here, you can see how much space that Smurf and Decay have to cross just to get onto London's backline. Again, they try and window to make this rotation easier, but London just kites, window back, and Boston are stuck between a rock and a hard place, aka open space. London however make a misplay in a different fight. Boston still window first from a similar position, but because Hardy isn't in front of Sparker, whereas Smurf is spinning in front of Birdwing, London loses the HP trade and are forced to give up space, allowing Boston to cap points, close distance, and clamour on top of London. Instead, 
I would like to see a similar play that London do later, which I just showed, where London rotate away, window down main, making it super hard for Smurf to cross. Hardy contests point, and then you can even put your May Lucio to flank through White Room, or help contest the point. Again, in this example here, you're always referring back to the key idea of forcing Boston to walk through open space, just to get on top of your backline, and then re-pushing when Boston's cycle of aggression is over. Again, from a rank perspective, you can see this from Hardy's most recent video on Malga vs Ryan. The clearest example was on Lee Jang Gardens, where the Malga had to walk through open space in 30 meters of distance just to get on top of Hardy. And because Malga has no shield or great team utility to rotate in these open spaces, the Malga and his team just get chunked before they can even touch points. Hardy was also baiting Malga's Kardec overdrive and playing super slow and from distance with his shield and then re-pushing once Malga doesn't have his overdrive since he doesn't get any lifesteal from just burning shield. Onto the third matchup and this video is getting long so let's speed it up a little. Poke dive comps usually consist of a mobile supports, a mobile tank and a mixture of both at DPS. At tank you'll normally have Doomfist or Ball, any choosing of Tracer, Ash, Hanzo, Sojourn, Genji, Echo, Sombra, and frankly half the DPS cast, and usually Ana Zen. Their basic win condition is to soften you up early and from range with soft dives from the Doomfist and the Ball until they've softened you up enough to where they then hard dive a squishy of yours. Your win condition is actually pretty varied. The spar framework still applies here, meaning if you're able to prevent the Doomfist from even engaging with basic poke damage, absorb it through bunkering, sustain cooldowns, and isolating their Doomfist entirely, and then rotating aggressively when he's on his downtime, you're off to a good start. But there's actually another win condition, which is trying to rotate and run it down on the enemy backline because of how much of a threat they are at range. Sparrow made a great video covering this matchup, and again this video is getting long so I'll link it below. Now onto the second to last matchup of just poke comps. And poke comps are just exactly that. Sigma plus the ranged snipers plus BAP Zen, but some teams will swap the BAP out for the Ana on occasion. Their win condition is straightforward, whittle down your composition so much that by the time you're on top of them, it's already too late. Your win condition is also straightforward. Isolate the Sigma with most likely clean walls, rotate between enclosed spaces with Symmetra TP, and force corner to corner situations where the enemy team have to walk forward and contest points. On Circuit Real first point defense for example, May is really broken here, as the Sigma and frankly the entire enemy comp are forced into a corner to corner situation, giving you this nice short sightline in open space, meaning it's easy to just W key and get a good wall. Lost matchup, thank gods. Pokeball comps are actually hybrids that you commonly see in your average quick play or rank games, but usually in pro play, the most recent Pokeball hybrid was the Sigma, Bap, Iliari, Soldier, and Symmetra comp. Their win condition is that the three man and a two man group splits with the Soldier and Iliari taking a different angle to the Sigma, Bap, and Symmetra, pressuring the Brawl comp from range and forcing them to rush you. And then when they do rush you, you pull back, lift through the rush, and then re push once their rush is over. Our win condition is varied. Look to overload with man advantage one of the two sides before the other side gets value, or on defense, just stalemate and match the Sojourn Alari with your May Lucio. This will burn the clock and force the Sojourn Aliari to play closer, which is perfect for a rush. Again, the GOAT Commander X made a 22 minute video going over this matchup, and Capitology also made a video going over this matchup, and this is just time that I don't have, but I still want to show at least an example of my own. For example, on Route 66, we can see Finland choose to overload the side of the Sigma, Baptiste and Symmetra. Because of the map geometry and how wide Soldier and Alari have to flank, and because of how enclosed and short sightline third point generally is, Lubda gets mocked by Cloud and dies before the Soldier and Iliari are in position. Still, Quartz does Quartz things and gets a pick, and Keisei does live and repush, but Vestola's Flux shuts down that fight for Finland. And that's it for the video. Starting off with Winston. Probably the most important thing I could tell a Winston player is to not force dives. This does link into section 2G, but I thought I would mention it here, because especially considering that your hero hasn't got an immense amount of burst damage or a stupid amount of sustain, trying to force a kill or force an engagement when your team isn't ready can spell death very quickly. Making sure that you have a very clear risk reward framework and that if you do hard engage, you do it because the reward is worth it is very important. In terms of your actual role, while that does depend on the comp you're playing against, you can and should be looking to use your added mobility to help flush out flankers during the staging process. 
If you spot a Sombra or a Tracer or a Genji on a flank and you can 2v1 them with your other DPS, that's free space you can attain. Barring that, in dive mirrors especially, and this does link into section 2b, if you're trying to flush out flankers and they're trying to get onto your backline, you can just zone off the enemy backline entirely and that actually helps peel for your backline. Specifically, Monkey, you being on the enemy backline actually sometimes helps this fight more than you actually going and like being in that fight personally. The only thing I would do for you, if you ever see a Sombra that's within jump range, you can jump on her and force her out and that's totally fine. Other than that, I do like Monkey staying in the enemy backline as long as he can. Not actually cleaving them or doing any damage to them doesn't matter, right? But just keeping them from supporting this fight that's going on is really important. Other key parts are making sure that you're comfortable with your primal mechanics, all of which you can learn in my separate Winston guide, ensuring you don't take too much damage in the pre-fight, especially against the ranged compositions, and having solid micro with your jump pack, secondary fire, melee, those are pretty much all key Winston mechanics. Jump pack placements pathing with your jump, basically meaning to try and come from quirky off angles, and trying to make sure you have some escape are overlooked bits of micro too. Now onto Tracer, who's probably got the highest skill ceiling in the game. She has some of the most important micro, from trigger discipline, blink management, terrain or cover usage, reload management, and maximizing pulse bomb sticks. Stuff like strafing and tracking are also micro too, but they're less specific to her kit. Her macro is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. The biggest choice you have to decide on Tracer is whether to mirror, aka duel the enemy flankers, or to head straight for backline. My general principle is that if your team has more range, you mirror, and if your team has more mobility, you go for backline. However, this is a pretty broad rule that can change based on map geometry and lines of sight. For example, if you're running Tracer Sombra against Tracer Ash, even though you have more mobility, you should try and 2v1 the Tracer outside of Ash's LOS. Maybe you even drag in another support too. Stuff can get complicated here, so here's a visual example from a top 500 lobby. Here, obviously, <coughs> this duel is not in your favour because the Baptiste is going to be healing Psycho and it's going to be a 2v1 the entire time. Obviously, Ram's not going to do much here. But like, if Weaver's playing properly and your Sim is here, you can just do this kind of thing and then 3v2 the Tracer. Now you get this space of the map, your team has this space, and if I zoom out a little bit further, the enemy team will have this space, which is really, really good for your comp, because now you can just stage a dive onto their backline, onto the soldier, and onto the honor with Tread, and that's completely fine, right? If you decided to go for backline and start to wrap around here, obviously you could just stage here or here, and then 3 2 1 dive the soldier with Tread. Again, if, I, I would prefer you doing this and you do this next fight, actually, but again, mirroring isn't the bad thing here, it's just that in the cer certain circumstances that you're subject to, aka the weaver's not with you mainly, you can't mirror this, and you need to know that, and you need to realise that, and fuck off and go away. And I think the macro is more nuanced, especially in, like, this sort of, like, weird-ass backline, mm -hmm. and in this weird-ass comp, because, again, you've got more, more mobility with TP, and Doom's got more mo mobility than Ramatra, but they've got more range with the Sojourn one-shot and KSA on, on Ramatra here. The second thing I wanted to know is... Again, if you're playing a more ranged backline, so like Zen here, right, the mirroring becomes even more important because this guy is squishier than Weaver and you will get more support because orbs are better than whatever Weaver can provide. Now onto Sombra. Honestly, you could put any hero in place of Sombra here because ever since the rework, she hasn't been in a great state due to the inability to hack from Invis. Generally speaking though, you have a few different playstyles, from playing Sombra 76, basically meaning you threaten hacks from the frontline and farm the tank from range, or you can play for flank and map control, often in combination with your tracer, as briefly mentioned prior, or you can stage pincers and full-on dive the enemy backline. Cover usage and uptime is still very important on Sombra. You actually don't have any mobility while you're fighting, since you're invisible in the pre-fight, and your translocator is used to escape in the post-fight. This is why in dive mirrors, Sombra is often the first one to get forced out, because she's by far the easiest to force out when compared to Winston and Tracer, but being smart with distance management, corner usage, playing in support LOS if possible, and using high ground can all extend and maximise your uptime. Lastly, I want to mention your EMP. Please do not treat EMP as a rigid set play. You can solo EMP DPS and confirm kills, which is something that Lip, probably the best summer player in the world, did pretty commonly. 
You can also EMP their tank to blow them up in case they overextend. EMP isn't just a backline dies button, think of it like a traitor's pulse bomb almost. In dive mirrors, your job is twofold. The biggest one is to obviously support your armor and clear flank threats. In team play, you'll likely be the one calling rotations, making sure both of you are playing together so you're able to peel. In dive mirrors, the brig will usually play in front of the armor to block nades, looking to ideally whipshot away the Winston before he jumps in, then bashing away to create distance, or you'll whipshot one of the flankers away, which takes a decent chunk off their total HP pool. Note that with the recent buff to Winston, making him pierce through armor, you need to be quicker with your CDs. If you do hit your abilities correctly and you rotate accordingly, there should be no possibility that something like a nano engage confirms a kill. Your second job is going to be to support your DPS, mostly with packs of which you need LOS and range to do so. Don't chase your flankers, they're usually more mobile than you and most of the time it's probably on them if they need your healing. Your third job is maximizing inspire uptime by brawling in the mid fights once all flank threats are cleared. Of course, there's other jobs you can do as Brig, like threatening shorts and angles, or juggling aggression with your frontline, but since those are usually less applicable to dive, I want to keep the scope of this video relatively focused. Now into Ana. By far the biggest mistake I see with Ana players has to be with nade timing and placements. I've seen peak top 7 Ana players mistime their nades with their frontline, and especially considering the nade nerf, stuff like this just can't happen. And uh, yeah, here's why I was talking about nade timing, right? So, what what's the issue with this nade? My monkey doesn't have jump yet. My monkey doesn't have bubble. My tracer's not in. Exactly, exactly, right? Like, so the, the nade here is actually good. Like, you get two people here, right? But no one's there's no follow up. Like the LeBron James meme, but like, there's no help. When your monkey actually just goes in, but you haven't got nades. As for your sleep darts, just don't waste it in dive mirrors. But against less mobile, more ranged comps, you can toss it in at roughly the same time as your nades. As for nano boost in dive mirrors. It's actually relatively common for Arnas to nano boost their other supports rather than nano their monkey, and you'll see why that is in the macro section. But nano Winston is of course a reliable way of getting value, especially when you're going against poke based anti-dive comps. Now onto the general macro. It's actually pretty simple. Use your added mobility to surround the enemy team and to control parts of the map that the enemy team just don't have time to control. Once everyone is in position and you have map control, then you execute a dive onto a target, ideally when they're in open space, and then you either keep going or you pull and disengage away, depending on how the dive goes. For a visual example, go to section 4E, that one is basically textbook. Also, shout out to Capitology, as a decent chunk of the following macro was inspired off his hour video. Again, all the links to the coaches and further resources will be down below in the description. Starting off with fighting frontlines instead of trading backlines, or in other words, fighting for flank control before you int in. The opposite of this is heading straight for backline, or cheating, which I talk about in that separate section. Fighting frontline just means forcing out and fighting the enemy tank, and fighting the enemy flankers, notably the Sombra Tracer, before you actually dive yourself. This is something I've raced beforehand when analysing why Overwatch League teams were failing in the Sombra Tracer meta, but it's also a point raised by Capitology in his video. The way that really good teams play, they almost always devote most of their resources to their own backline, right? Rule 1, never die. If you put a ton of resources into your own backline, then the worst case scenario is that your backline doesn't die and their backline doesn't die and we're even. And maybe we give some space. And that's a totally fine worst case scenario. The worst case scenario if you try and trade backlines is that they don't die and your backline does die. And then that fucks a bunch of shit up for you, obviously. If you try and trade this fight and then you win, you can't go back and say, oh, let's help this fight. Your backline's dead, right? But you can always go help your backline and then pressure the enemy backline. What you should do is just your monkey stays cart and zones the backline and everybody else, both of your DPS peel and make sure rule one is not violated and your break doesn't die. Essentially, if you're able to force out the enemy Sombra by directly killing her, or you're able to force out the enemy Winston to give up a ton of space with a good hack or general range threats, you single-handedly prevent the enemy dive from being able to dive in the first place. For keen viewers of mine, you'll know that this aligns with the prevent stage in my SPAR framework. Here's an example on King's Row, and it's very simple. Smurf takes a bunch of damage from an unmarked Hanzo and is forced to give up space and commit bubble. Toronto then rotate without any worry while speedily forces points, putting Boston under time pressure. Realizing they need to make a play, Lee J Gon drops to try and get a trade and dies. That all stemmed from Smurf being in a punishable position from the Hanzo. Here's another Overwatch League example, this time from playoffs. You can see Shy quote unquote 
fighting frontline by managing to find the pick straight onto Lip. And as a result, you can just see Atlanta stack and wait around for Lip to return. You then also see Leaf punish or fight frontline again and control the flank that Stalker is attempting to take. As a result, Stalker gets forced out and gets a rushed, scuffed pulse bomb. Then, even worse, after Stalker's recoil has been forced, Donghak for some reason decides to dive a Nana Boost onto Spark's backline, but because the frontline of the flankers, being the Tracer Sombra, have already been forced out, this Nana Boost dive from Atlanta has no teeth and it's super easy to peel. The Spark then absorb that dive, rotate aggressively, and dive themselves. Because this concept is so important, here's yet another example, this time from the mid-season Madness Finals. Here, you can see Lip trying to fight Frontline and punish Phyllis, and he forces Jump, meaning Phyllis can't dive. And you're seeing Houston do the same thing to Lip, forcing him out so Atlanta can't dive. You're also seeing Pelican trying to sneak some stickies onto Donghak, and the two Tracers fighting underneath the Lighthouse by Coast. All for the same reason, and they're all broadly doing the same thing. They're fighting for space and playing for their backline. Stalker, however, decides to cheat and skips straight to backline, which I'm not a fan of since it breaks this rule, and it also breaks the rule of trying to avoid forcing plays, which I talk about in section 2G. And you can see this since even though they get Shu, Atlanta still lose this fight because trading backlines just gets messy. Now to section 2C, which is basically turns or tempo. This idea of turns was coined by former contenders coach Nata, and it basically means that each team has a period of time where they want to synchronize a lot of their aggression and cooldowns. For example, on Suavasa, Atlanta's turn was when Donghak engaged with Nana Boost, but obviously, because Atlanta's flankers were forced out, their turn didn't go well. Then, it was Spock's turn to dive, where Leaf gets two with Pulse Bomb. This also links into the ebb and flow or push and pull video I made, so go watch that video for more details. I also recommend Capitology's turn video, but I'm not going to elaborate too much more because it's not that important. Stuff from Section 2B, like fighting frontline and taking angles on the enemy Winston to force him out, still heavily apply here. So, say you now have map control. You've done your homework and you've put in the effort, or you're just playing against a bad team that gives you the flank control for free. Now, you can actually go for a dive. However, communication is very important. Specifically, you usually want your tank to engage first, then around half a second later, your DPS engage and your Ana nades. This half a second is pretty important, as I've explained in my timing video, but in short, if you go second as DPS, even by half a second, the entirety of the enemy team are going to be focused on your tank, and not on you. But how do you communicate this? Well, it depends for each team. The two most common that I see are the classic 3-2-1 calls, and then if somebody can't go, they shout wait. But if everyone's ready, they just go on the 3-2-1 call. The downside to this is that 3-2-1 is a bit rigid. I've had teams and players who say wait when their tank does the 3-2-1 countdown and the tank still goes in anyways. An alternative is just saying I'm looking to go or I'm wanting to dive or can we go? Just stating your intention basically. Then people either say wait or they say nothing and then they dive. Now onto kill boxes and LOS checks. I've already made two separate videos on killboxes and webbing that you can access from my advanced guides playlist, link in the top right. So I'll try to make this section a bit more concise. In essence, a killbox is just an area where you want to set up a dive and actually kill people. It's usually an open space. The reason why I've grouped in LOS checks is because you want everyone in your team to have LOS or line of sight onto your killbox. Again, I've coached and seen teams where that Winston just dives or extends past his killbox, where his team can't see him. And you can see this in the background with the Winston. This does link into section 2G about not forcing plays and into section 1A because the Winston is trying to force a play onto the Kiriko. But Red Team's killbox should just be the bridge across high grounds. It's an open space and just play the range of your Ash. Now onto backline synchrony. This is one of the most important concepts for backlines to get down, which is rotating as a core together and not getting splits. Unless you're playing against the MP, your Brig Ana should almost always stay stacked and Brig should be the one calling the rotations. For example, here on the Toronto Defiance, Toronto manages to punish Frontline and catch Smurf. The handle pick here is actually quite smart, because it means that Sam is playing in a position where it's very hard for Sombra Tracer to punish and mark, due to the lack of vertical mobility. If Boston were running Genji, Sam would definitely be marked, 
and lose map control. But regardless, Toronto couldn't ask for a better pick and they still lose the fight because Ultraviolet is miles away from his brig. This means the brig literally cannot peel for the honor due to the lack of LOS, no Inspire and no threat of whip shots, bash or regular flailing. As a result, Kaluj can't get healed and dies, meaning this 5v4 turns into a 3v4 and Toronto lose the fights. No wonder OG got dropped a month later. The only time you should really be playing Split in Brig Honor is against EMP. Capitology talked about this in his video, where Honor can reactively self-nade if she gets EMP'd and Brig can send repair packs. The reason why playing Split in EMP is so important is that worst case scenario, only one of your supports can die. But if you both stack, both of you are pretty much guaranteed to die. If you play splits, you play around cover and you have LOS between both supports, you have a decent chance of living. For example, in this fight here, you can see Monk and Lengsa are playing splits. Lengsa rallies early because point hits 99 and he probably doesn't want to get EMP'd just in case. As a result, Monk gets EMP'd but Lengsa doesn't. And Lengsa is an LOS of Monk so he's able to peel and absorb Atlanta's dive. Now onto this section, which honestly is just about greed and flexibility. Essentially, don't push or force kills out of greed, and I think this is something the Winston, Sombra and Tracer players do quite a lot, because they're on heroes that can carry. For example, when Stalker gets forced out, he tries to force a player with Pulse Bomb that was never gonna hit anyways. Then, Donghak forces a dive by himself. Here's another example from a Winston player forcing a play with his primal onto a backline that just aren't gonna die. What sets off the red flag in my head, if Brig and Ana are ever connected, you're never gonna kill both of them, right? Around here, this is where I would have stopped. You see that they're connected, there's no way you kill these people ever. Your DPS aren't with you, just give up on it, jump back, make sure you don't die. Because you should have died around here to a good team. Their Sombra just does not give a fuck if her team lives or dies, and the Tracer Rando died early last fight. Just be careful about that. This also includes set ultimate plays, especially EMP, as mentioned in section 1C. And lastly, juggling points. I thought I'd bring this up, because especially when you're running Doomfist, who has almost no ability to hold space, contesting the objective, which is what wins you the game, can be tough to do. The solution is to juggle point with your mobile DPS heroes, ideally you have a Tracer, and all your Brig and Rally. It's tip for tat kind of gameplay that requires coordination, so make sure you cycle this in well. Finally, on to cheating. Pretty sure Spyro had a video on this, so I'm gonna make this quick, but cheating is essentially skipping the staging parts, or section 2B, and heading straight for backline. You only really do this if you have a massive advantage, which is mostly gonna be through ultimates like EMP, or if the map is just so linear, like Colosseo, whether Arno flanks the fight over. Hashtag remove the Colosseo glass. Now onto tank variations. Just like my brawl guide, I'll split this into each role, explain the pros and cons, and you can choose which option suits you or your team's playstyle better for that specific situation. Since there's generally more dive variations, I'll have to be a bit quicker. There's three main variations to Winston. Doomfist, Diva, and Ball. Starting with Doom. His biggest pro by far has to be the burst damage and burst mobility. If someone is out of position, even for a split second, he and Tracer can instantly blow up their targets. In that way, his ability to control the map, at least for short bursts of time, is unparalleled. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. His biggest con is the inability to hold space compared to Winston. He's got no bubble for his team to use, and most importantly, if the Doomfist isn't playing carefully, he himself can get forced out and bursted down. On to D.Va. Now I admit, there's gonna be coaches out there with a better macro overview between D.Va and Winston, mainly Cuffy because he's coached the top D.Va team for ages, but in essence, the biggest blessing and also curse with D.Va is that she can do everything. She can peel, dive, bunker, duel, etc. It's why she's a great flexible pick into pretty much any comp in the game. However, her biggest con and the way you play into D.Va is twofold. Essentially, force her to play first and commit to a playstyle, then play to a separate playstyle that she chooses. It's hard to describe without an example, so credit to Coffee for this. So even if there's four seconds of downtime on both of you, if you was to land here, not drop, set up for your next hit, you can pretty much force an engagement on their backline, and what does that do? The second D.Va has uptime, she's in a situation where she either has to fly on your backline or fly to protect their backline. That's all you have to do against D.Va, right? 
D.Va has to do everything in Overwatch. She has to play for poke, she has to play for brawl, she has to play to dive, right? And all you need to do is give her a choice between two, three of those jobs and then play to the separate win condition that she chooses. So if she plays to peel, bunker, what do you do? You just drop and allow your team to poke, take angles, take positions. If she chooses to dive, it leaves behind an entire payload that our tracer can just force. Now into ball. Honestly, this might be an oversimplification, but I just see him as a worse Doomfist. He's got more sustain than Doom, that's for sure, but his movement is more clunky, meaning he's got worse burst mobility, and Pile Driver isn't as good as Empowered Punch. The only scenario where I see Ball as the best dive tank is against the brawl compositions. Your adaptive shields and your health pull become very useful to survive Maywalls and Bunkers, and you have consistent AoE damage thanks to your fireball roll throughs and your pile driver. Now into DPS variations. There's a lot here, so I'm going to rattle through as many as I can. Ash. Again, the pros are similar to Wrecking Ball. I find that Ash is the best dive variation against hard brawl teams thanks to the AoE damage and dynamite, and having Bob to force points, something that dive teams often struggle doing. She's also fairly good on high ground based maps that have decently long sightlines. Ash on Gibraltar or Dorado defense isn't a bad pick, but she's just too squishy. Her massive head hitbox, the movement speed reduction when scoped in, and the underwhelming burst mobility in Coach Gun make her vulnerable to high burst damage dive comps, especially ones with Genji in them. Sojun, still one of the best DPS heroes in the game, a perfect blend of range and mobility thanks to having it in powerful bursts. Not to mention, you also have one of the strongest DPS ults in the game. The downside is just honestly the opportunity cost you're losing by not running Sombra Tracer, which is less map control, but it's less so a con as it is a difference in playstyle. Echo. More consistent range threat with more variable mobility compared to Sojourn in exchange for no one-shots. Echo is great on maps with a plethora of high ground that Sombra Tracer can't easily get to, like Ilios Wolf for example, as well as having a greater ability to punish frontline with the added consistent ranged poke. Again, the biggest downside is just what you're missing out on compared to other heroes due to the opportunity cost. Whether that's the Sojourn one-shot or the Sombra map control or even a consistent valued ultimate. Still, Echo is a very good variation. Genji. Similar pros and cons to Echo, but with much greater burst damage and mobility, and much greater chain potential. Honestly, as of the making of this video, he's a better pick than Sombra in the majority of cases, and is able to juggle aggro more effectively thanks to his deflect. Honestly, the burst damage and deflect is why you see the Jungle Queen Genji die hybrids instead of Jungle Queen Echo or Jungle Queen Sombra comps. Hanzo. I believe trying to play this in the World Cup at one point, so hopefully I'll use that as back on gameplay. He essentially fulfills an alternative role to Sojourn or Ash, and if you've watched my Brawl Guide, you'll already be familiar with the pros and cons. The ability to one-shot all the time, the scouting information, and the burst damage to give him advantageous jewels, and the vertical mobility are all nice, but his own squishiness, lack of burst mobility, lack of consistent damage, and a bad ultimate, all work against him to be an unpopular dive DPS. Farah. Yes, Farah is a poke dive hero, just like Echo. Despite me putting Farah in D tier in every tier list I've ever made, Pharmacy can actually be quite valid. It's by far the best against Symmetra based brawl comps, because the Farah is uncontested, you maximise the AoE damage, since brawl comps are usually clumped, and Concussion Blast is great for disrupting TP rotations. The issue with Pharmacy is actually the speed. Now I say speed and not mobility, because Pharmacy does have the mobility to off-angle from anywhere on the map. But a coordinated dive on your flex support, or a coordinated hit on your tank before your Farah even does anything, can be quite rough. There are ways to mitigate this by running D.Va so your tank doesn't blow up, and by running Tracer to guard your flex supports, and this is something that Golden Glory, a top Saudi Arabian team that I've coached, normally do. And this is pretty much standard practice for most pharmacy teams. But it's certainly not perfect on every map, and it's certainly not perfect if you haven't got the hero pool for it. Widowmaker. Yes, the one shot is very useful. In the dive mirror, if Widow is able to get a few body shots into dive heroes, she can really scuff up the dive before it even happens. But if that doesn't, it's gonna be hard to run Widow. She's very LOS based, meaning if a smart dive team just path outside her LOS, 
she's not going to be doing much beforehand, and then she just dies during the actual dive. It's why she's best on super open, ranged maps with few flank routes like Hollywood's. Now onto support variations, and thankfully, there aren't too many, and they're mostly done to swap out the brig. First up is Kiriko. I actually really like Kiriko variations, because the biggest benefit is the extra map control. You can and should be playing split from your Ana as Kiriko, because you can always TP back. Support LOS still matters, so you should be playing in a zone or area where you can still support your Tracer or your Sojourn or whatever DPS you're running, but you're allowed to play closer to them compared to Brig. Another pro is that you can actually do shit against Brawl comps unlike Brig. Brig has no range threats, and if she wants to get up close and brawl, she just gets ran over. I genuinely still don't know why Atlanta had ran Brig against London. Obviously, the biggest downside is the lack of defensive peel. If you can't help your Tracer prevent the dive by forcing a 2v1, you and your Ana might be cooked. Teleporting back to your Ana and suzering also puts yourself at risk. In dive mirrors, it's just safer to play Brig. Next up is Lucio. Lucio Ana isn't that common nowadays, and for good reason. In mirrors, Lucio is just a worse peeler, and because you're not going to get much out speeding heroes who are already mobile and speeding onto heroes who can just use their escape CDs to run away, Lucio Ana isn't a great variation unless you want to have a more brawly thing going on by running Lucio Kiri or Lucio Moira instead. Mercy and Zen are also variations you can run and dive if you want to poke dive hybrids. Again, the biggest benefit is running these heroes over Brig when you play dive against harder brawl comps. You're not going to get ran over when you're playing Zen or Mercy against the relatively immobile comps, and frankly, against the Risa Brig Bap comps, I really think dive teams should be running on a Zen or a more pokier version of their dive. The downside, of course, is that you lack defensive peel, but the question you should be asking yourself is whether you need that defensive peel against the comp you're playing against. Now into matchups. The first matchup, Dive vs Brawl. Brawl teams will usually consist of Ryan, Ram or Sigma, any mixture of Mei, Symmetra, Sojourn, Cass, Hanzo or Bastion, and Lucio Bap. Your win condition as Dive is to use the map and surround the Brawl comp as much as possible. The Brawl team's win condition is to prevent you guys from taking the map with the range threats and then absorb the Dive once it actually happens. So how do you prevent the prevent stage so to say? Well, just play Kiriko. Or just play in a way that supports your DPS getting those crucial off angles. If all of you are too split, you can get out dueled, and this happened to Vancouver and Shock when London played against them. You need support LOS. As for preventing the absorb stage, I first need to explain how the absorb stage works. In my brawl guide, I talked about bunkering and creating dead zones to reduce the angles from which the dive teams can stage from. So, how do you beat this if you're the dive team? Well, this is actually a problem that I had to consider as I myself coach a top 500 dive team, and there's three main solutions. The first one is obvious, use ultimates. We saw this in the London-Houston series, but by virtue of Happy having EMP, it forced London to move away from their bunker position and take a risky TP rotation, forcing them in open space and allowing a clean dive by Houston. EMP is the most obvious case of this, but any array of ultimates should be able to break through a bunker. Do make sure to kite back though if they beat. On Midtown, this is also how Shock eventually broke through London's bunker. And honestly, this is your main way of breaking bunkers. In neutrals however, bunkers are pretty hard to break. Which leads me onto the second solution. Run more poke based heroes. Gator actually brought this up in the Uncoachable podcast, saying that he wished Atlanta just ran more quote unquote poke shits. What's funny is we went Tracer Genji in the warm up, and then me and Hawk were telling them that if you go this, you will lose. You 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 cannot win playing that. Like it makes no fucking sense. Like what the fuck are you on Tracer Genji for in 2023 versus a fucking Ryan retake? What would you have played? I would have played more poke. I would have played more poke shit. Also, if we're gonna play Doom, Hawk would have played. Like Hawk gets kills on Doom. He's not, he's not playing just to live. He's not playing ping pong Doom. Like he would he would literally one tap like your bap or, or someone. You know he would he would actually find a kill. But no, we should we should have we should have just played more poke shit. But instead, we were trying to hard dive it and play for like nano shit. You know, we didn't do fair. We didn't do echo ash or any of that kind of shit. Yes, this does mean that you need to make a more poke dive hybrid comp. But heroes like Sombra, Tracer, and especially Brig are just too easy to shut down in close to medium range, which is where they're effective. The third solution is to rotate and swing wide with support LOS. For example. I gave this case on Ilios Ruins, with Baptista bunkering by the catwalk. But by virtue of bunkering, you are giving up the entire map. So bloody use it! 
Swing wide if you're playing Kiriko, Echo, Sombra, Genji, Tracer, Junkrat, etc. It's like that quote from Ryan Holiday. A castle can be an intimidating, impenetrable fortress, or it can be turned into a prison when surrounded. Now obviously, you won't be able to do this on every map, and you might not be able to do this fast enough if the enemy brawl team just rotate with sim TPs, like London tried to do on Antarctica. But that's the beauty of Overwatch. It's kinda like a cat and mouse game, where the team who plays the better macro, wins. It's also worth noting by the way, that against hard brawl comps, you usually have your backline split. This is because you can get more angles to force out the brawl comp, and if either support gets rushed on, only one of them get rushed instead of both supports. Sparrow went over this with Sumito and the Vegas Eternal, which will be linked in the top right or down below. Now onto Brawl Dive. They usually involve Zarya, Orisa, Queen or Mauga, Genji, Reaper, Sojin or Echo, and Lucio, Kiriko or Moira. Both your win conditions are actually pretty similar to the Brawl matchup, so I won't bother reiterating, just skip the section 4A. The thing I will say though, that is more common for Brawl Dive comps, compared to straight up brawl comps, is that brawl dive will look to rush straight onto your backline, usually because they have more mobility than hard brawl comps. Boston basically permanently did this in their series against the Spark, where they ended up finishing 4th, and while I think Boston could definitely benefit from bunkering a lot more in that series, I'll still go through how the Spark dealt with Boston's rush. Firstly, Gushui on Doom was always set up to pinch and destroy and disrupt Boston's backline whenever they rushed. Doom is really good at this compared to Winston because of the CC and burst damage, but Wrecking Ball is also fairly good at this too. Meanwhile, Spark's backline will use abilities defensively to peel off the rush. Note how far Boston's backline go through open space just to kill Spark, meaning it's super easy to trade out Boston's backline despite Shy dying. Also, do note that Leave does see 9 the points, which punishes Boston for rushing in the first place, and if Spark's backline lives, which they mostly do, Leave can then join in on the pincer. So 4 key things there, set up your Doom Vista Disrupt, punish Boston's backline when they rotate in open space, use your cooldowns and ultimates defensively, and force point to drag back and punish Boston. Since you're also playing against some kind of dive hybrid, the Brick Honor can and should stack a lot more. Dive versus Poke. You already know what Poke teams run. Sigma, Ash, Widow, Hanzo, Zen, Honor, Mercy, Bap. Their win condition is fully set in the prevent stage. Get as much damage onto the Tracer taking that flank, chunk down that Winston's armor, force their CDs early, etc. Your win condition is basically just as normal. Take the map, fight for flanks, punish isolated DPS targets who are trying to be too greedy with their positioning, and collapse onto a target when you have map control. Thankfully, I have a perfect Grandmaster Sombra Tracer VOD against a full poke team. So I'll just play a clip of a good fight, another clip of a bad fight for reference. So the dive is actually going on right now, this is nice. Sombra calls 3 2 1. If you can't go for whatever reason, maybe you get rocked by a Sombra. <laughs> a summer ball in you get chucked down all your armor right and you can't dive in because you haven't got armor then you need to say wait thankfully you don't, you don't take much damage here which is good i'd prefer my brig stacking with my honor here to allow her to walk up uh but apart from that the dive here looks pretty good we've got three different angles timing here is good too and hanzo gets collapsed on the monkey goes in now right and then look where you are right so yeah that's, that's a few issues here right you haven't got an aid right so issue number one Issue number two, you can't see shits. Yeah, I think we should have also just, we, we didn't even need to go through through building. I you think. didn't, you didn't know. You could just literally walk up from here to here, right? I imagine that you, you're here and you land a nade. Like, this, this fight's over. It's like, like, wrap it up. It's done. On to the penultimate comp. Poke dive comps usually consist of Doomfist, Wrecking Ball or Diva, Tracer, Ash, Genji, Cassidy, Echo, and to be honest, frankly, any of the DPS cast, and the supports are usually double flex with Ana Zen or Ana Kiriko. Their win condition is to control space from afar. They're still fighting for flank control, but just doing it in a different way that's pretty heavy on LOS. You yourself actually have multiple win conditions. You can play to force out their Doomfist entirely, you can play to 2v1 their DPS, or you can play to just set up a dive against a squishy as you would against a flat out poke team. Speaking about 2v1 in their DPS, if you're playing Sombra Tracer and they're playing Ana Zen Tracer Ash, you need to 2v1 the Tracer outside of the Ana Zen Ash LOS. Conversely, the Tracer wants to fight you in LOS of their Ana Zen Ash. If you're able to catch the Tracer isolated, that can be a great trigger. And finally, onto the last matchup. Poke Brawl usually consists of Orisa or Sigma, Symmetra, Sojourn, Ash, or any array of poke oriented DPS and Bat, Brig, Ilari, Kiriko. This is often referred to as Saudi comp, 
due to its popularization in the World Cup. Because the script is about to touch 6k words, I'm just going to skip straight to the example I want to show. Here, we see Houston doing a lot of things right. We see Phyllis initially push out and control the space that Mera is trying to take, and Mera gets 2 v one by the Soldier and the Doomfist. Next, we get a really nice view of Houston's setup. This is honestly perfect positioning by Violets. He's positioning in such a way where he can help either flank, particularly Pelican, but he can also force and juggle point, and also bash out if someone decides to spin onto him. Now, with Houston having put in the work to control the map, they get a well positioned, well timed nano boost dive past RuPaul's Matrix and Merit's visor. Pelican cleans up with Focusing Beam, and nobody is punishing him because the entirety of Florida are looking at the souped up Doomfist in their backline. And that's where I want to end off this video. Not only because the script is very long, but also because that example you just saw is textbook dive. Controlling the map thanks to your mobility, and then hard committing when you have the pieces to do so, namely being positioning and ultimates. Anyways, further resources will be down below, and until next time. Starting off with the normal poke tank, I have Sigma. Now I think Sigma is a much more versatile tank than what I gave him credit for in the past, which was reflected by my placement of Sigma in the mediocre tiers of my old tier lists. But Sigma's key USP, or in other words, what he's really good at, is ranged marking. In other words, your job as Sigma is to usually mark the most threatening or aggressive enemy heroes who will usually be ranged DPS or supports. This will mainly be through your shield and your hyperspheres, making sure to block that on a nade during the dive, denying that Sojourn Railgun, or those Echo Stickies while your team rotates, etc. I'll talk about this more in section 4A and 4B, alongside in the Saudi examples that I'll give throughout, but it's why Sigma is usually not great against highly mobile dive compositions, especially stuff like Lucio Kiri Winston, because what the fuck can you mark on Sigma? The answer to that question is actually the DPS, like Tracer and Genji, and you can mark those heroes with your hyperspheres. But that is very hard to do, unless your name is Tread, and actually, here's a TikTok that I made on the best Sigma player in the UK, and how you can actually play Sigma into dive. People think Sigma is actually really bad into dive heroes like Sombra, Tracer, Genji, those kind of heroes, but if you're mechanically talented enough and you can actually hit your hyperspheres onto these squishy targets before they actually dive, that makes things a lot, lot messier, and that means that the dive is a lot easier to absorb. And as we can see here, Tread gets two really nice hyperspheres onto the Genji, and even better, he manages to flick and get the rock onto the Genji when the Baptiste is just one HP. If that Genji lives for like a second longer and gets that melee off, we probably get this Baptiste and we probably win this fight. But because Tread gets those two hyperspheres early on and gets the rock, that does not happen for uh, our team there. And this is where the second concept of marking with your shield comes into play here. He decides to shield off, rock, and mark the Ana and the Zenyata here. So he gets a really nice rock into Key Dog there on the Ana, and then he's able to shield off both of these ranged damage threats, which makes it easier for his team to peel off the Doomfist. With regards to the rest of your kit, make sure you're looking in between your hypersphere shots for scouting formation, saving your rock as a failsafe, or using it to land your combo from afar, and remember to fly to high ground with your flux where possible. Poke comps don't usually have mobility, and this is one of your few times where you'll be able to easily attain high ground, so use it. Now into Sojun, who's been meta for at least a few months now, and is such a good hero that she can fit into almost any hybrid comp. I'm not going to repeat what I said about Sojourn in my Brawl Guide, so I recommend you go watch that video for more details, but Sojourn's cycle isn't that complex. Sojourn is simple, but that doesn't mean she's easy. You charge up your Railgun, take an angle, click on her head, and either push or pull depending on your ability to hit that critical shot. So this final DPS slot is actually really contested. I chose to go with Symmetra because not only does she not get enough love, but she gives the poke comp way more flexibility if you're trying to play it against dive, and if you're trying to avoid things like Nanoblade, which is a key reason as to why Saudi Arabia chose Symmetra over other DPS options. Your two key roles in Symmetra is to proactively force out flankers with TP, or just your normal orbs, which is something that we saw both the Spitfire do, and also Saudi Arabia do as well. The second thing is using TPs to take map control, as I'll talk about later, but some common uses of TP is to kite back or bait enemy ults like Nanoblade, skip rotations in open space, and a lot more. Just like with my Brawl Guide, it's a lot easier to show and explain the utility of Symmetra with actual examples, especially against Dive, 
so I recommend heading to section 2 and section 4 for more details, alongside going to my brawl guide as well. The last thing is actually bunkering. Yes, it might seem weird for a poke team to bunker, you're a hybrid comp. This is something Saudi Arabia should have done a lot more against Team China in the World Cup, but again, skip to section 2G for more details on bunkering. Now onto Iliari. Thanks to her, she pioneered the modernised version of the poke comp straight back into Overwatch 2. If it wasn't for her, this video probably wouldn't exist. In short, your main role as Iliari is to get the fuck off main and to support one of your split cores, aka your off angle pressure. Usually, that'll be the off angle taken by your other DPS, namely Sojin or Soldier, and thanks to your pylon, the both of you should be able to stay on that off angle for a prolonged period of time. I thought I'd quickly cover your ult usage too, because it's not just an aggressive ult to win duels. While that is definitely one of the uses, against dive comps, you can use it early to prevent the dive from even happening, and to clear space, which I'll talk about in one of the later sections, or you can pop it around your other support to zone off the dive, or you can use it after the dive has happened to keep the dive on their back foot. Now onto Baptiste. Bap and flex support in general is one of the simplest roles in the game, but that doesn't make it easy. Your main job as BAP is going to be supporting the other core, or your main core, which will normally include your tank. The most important thing I can say with BAP is mid-fight positioning. Especially when you're playing against Dive, finding places to exo jump to high ground is pretty important for your survival. This advice also applies to Baptiste in almost any other comp in the game, but I've seen really good teams lose fights because the bat player just rotates in open space and dies or gets traded. Leo too, you need Leo, you need to be on high ground. You're safer and you've got good LOS. You can easily flush out this Kiriko from this high ground here. Traitor can't access you. That, that's, that's just gonna happen, right? Like that rotation to high ground is super important. The general macro of how your comp functions is fairly simple. Against most comps, you split into two groups or cores. In other words, your Sojin Iliari splits and take an off angle, while your Sigma, Symmetra and Baptiste hold space down main. Both cores should ideally have line of sight onto each other. Due to the natural range of your composition, against bad teams who stack, you're likely going to get a pick. But against better teams, one of your cores are going to get pushed or overloaded. That's when the core getting pushed will eventually pull, while the other core who aren't being pushed will push back. It's hard to explain without a visual example, but there'll be plenty of examples in the matchup section and throughout as well. Now to controlling lanes. Poke is especially at its strongest when the damage is coming from multiple different directions, and your main goal is to end up for a 3-2 split or a 2-2-1 split where the enemy team can't contest any of your angles. Since there aren't any public examples of poke mirrors in Overwatch 2, I'll have to create my own. Because the software I'm using is quite old, any Overwatch 2 heroes aren't in here, so I've denoted Zen to be Iliari and Soldier to be Sojin. Usually the easiest way poke can take space into another poke comp is to overload one of the cores. You can do this by sim TPing everyone, or your Sojin Iliari plus another DPS or a support overload one side. Once this happens, congrats, you now have more map control, and you should have at least two lanes of control. What you do now just depends on the enemy comp that you're up against. If you're playing up against a brawl comp for example, and you're running Hanzo instead of Symmetra, you can actually have a 2-2-1 split going, where your Soldier and Iliari could take Hotel, your Sigma pugs from main, and your Baptiste Hanzo can utilise the high grounds. Line of sight is very important here. Notice how the Baptiste is able to see and help out every teammate. This also nicely leads me into the next section about push and pull in poke comps, because the Brawl team, if they're good, aren't going to sit still and take your poke. They're going to look to overload one of your cores, probably the one in Hotel. There's two options here. If they 5-man rush your Sojin Iliari in Hotel, your Sojin Iliari are going to pull away, and your Baptiste Hanzo, thanks to their line of sight, will threaten the Brawl to keep chasing them in open space into their damage. This is what Saudi Arabia did to Finland in one fight, where Finland tried to overload the side of KSA. KSA, or the Sigma, pulled into the line of sight of his Iliari Sojourn, and then Saudi Arabia re-pushed from multiple different angles, and because Finland had already used their cooldowns, this fight was pretty over. Your other option is just to trade backlines. If your Hanzo for some reason is on a crazy off angle, or you're playing more mobile heroes like Genji, Tracer, Echo, Mercy or Pharmacy, you can look to chase the tail of the enemy rush comp 
and destroy that enemy Baptiste when they rotate. Because of the map geometry on this specific example, i.e. hotel has a ton of cover, you'll usually just resort to the first option. A more visually clear example of what this would look like would be on Lee Jank Night Market, where the Brawl team rush an open space straight onto your Arna or Baptiste, then your pharmacy will just chase the tail of the enemy rush, kill the Baptiste and then some. Another thing worth mentioning is to know when your backline should stack or should split. Thankfully, this theory is pretty simple. If you're against hard brawl comps, so stuff like Ryan, Lucio, Baptiste, you almost always want your backline split. This is solely because the disadvantage of being split, meaning you're isolated, doesn't really matter against brawl comps. They just haven't got the mobility to punish a Zen who's playing split from his honor. And you get all the advantages. If you were stacked and the rush team rush onto you, both of you would probably die. Now the worst case scenario is that only one of you die. You also get more angles, which means it's easier to get damage on the brawl comp, and it increases your serendipity of getting a random kill or a big nade by virtue of playing splits. However, against comps with any form of mobility, so any dive comp, you can't really play splits. That's mainly because one of your supports are just going to get isolated and blown up before you can actually do anything. I will say there is a grey area where you can play soft off angles against dive comps and making sure there is a line of sight between both supports, but you can still damage the enemy dive comp from multiple different angles. Now into clearing space with your ultimates. In poke comps, you'll have an array of ultimates to clear space with. Namely, Bap Window, Captive Sun, Simwall, High Noon, and to a lesser extent, Flux and Overclock. But make sure that when you clear space with ultimates, you actually take it. This is something that Saudi Arabia was fairly inconsistent with. Not only stacking ultimates that do the same thing, but not even clearing and taking the space that ults are meant to take. Now I debated about putting this in the dive section specifically, but considering how much dive you're going to face when playing any poke variation, I thought this deserved its own section. I've pretty much brought it up in every comp guide, but this is going to be solely about the absorb stage in my spa framework. It's something that Saudi Arabia never really did against China in the World Cup. They much prefer trading backlines and ending up in a 3v3 mechanical mess of a team fight. Credit to Commander X for the overhead view, which I'll be commentating over. As you can see in this team fight, the Iliari Sojourn try and get value on the off angle, but I think this is too greedy. You can always take the off angle later, but you can't always peel the dive later. Here, I would have preferred the Bap Sojourn Iliari to be playing distance on the high ground and to be playing that soft off angle where they still have cover and good line of sight to control space from. Since Saudi Arabia would be playing tighter here, it would be much easier to peel off the Winston dive. I prefer KSA playing a bit tighter too, still zoning off the Brigana with the shield, but also looking for a rock onto Gushue and also firing hyperspheres towards the Hanzo. Now, after Saudi Arabia absorbs the dive, they can re-push onto the high ground, which is actually what they do, but they just do it in the wrong order. Here's yet another fight where Saudi Arabia prioritizes the trade over the absorb. Firstly, Saudi do well in the prevent stage by catching leave. Good start. But then, China still pull the trigger with a nano primal dive, but Majed prioritizes the trade onto the enemy honor. Here, I would have much preferred Majed to ult Gushui, making his life more difficult, and KSA can mock the Arna nade with his shield, and he can mock the Hanzo with his hyperspheres, and he can mock Gushui with his rock. All the while, Saudi Arabia play in a bunkered position by the Mega. And this very nicely leads me on to bunkering, a key factor to the absorb stage. You might be a bit confused. How are poke teams supposed to bunker? Isn't that supposed to be a thing for brawl teams? And you are right. But this is a poke brawl hybrid. Bunkering is an option available to you, especially against dive teams. And this is something that I think Saudi could have done way better in when they played against China in the finals. You have Sim Turrets, you have BAP Regen Burst and his Immortality Field, you have Disrupt the Short and Power Slide, you have Sigma's amazing ability to mark multiple angles at once. Why would you ignore this key bit of macro? So, as I just said, Saudi Arabia could have just bunkered by the Mega, but they also could have bunkered in that first example too. On Route 66, Saudi Arabia threw yet another fight where they got a pick in the prevent stage by still looking for off-angle value rather than looking to absorb the dive. I would have much preferred Saudi Arabia to bunker in the gas station, force points, and set up with sim turrets. They actually do bunker once at the start of second point, and guess what? They ended up successfully absorbing a nano doom engage with the meteor strike and winning the fight. That's four examples where bunkering could have and did in fact help Saudi Arabia beat China's dive. 
While bunkering might not be that useful in mirrors or against raw comps, it's definitely a usable tool against dive compositions. While I don't have any examples, bunkering is also useful if you're playing into a comp that has more range. If you're playing Brigame Sigma for example, into Zen Hanzo Sigma, bunkering can be used as a tool, in combination with forcing the points, to force that pokier, more ranged comp to come closer. If you're the Zen Hanzo team for reference, just swing wide and play more aggressive angles that the enemy Pokeball team can't control. Now onto variations, starting with the tanks. The only alternative Pokeball tank to Sigma is Orisa, since Orisa Bapiliari has actually been seen before. Especially with Orisa's range being mega buffed, she technically has more consistent range than Sigma. She also has way more individual sustain by virtue of her fortify and armor. But I really don't like Orisa variations for two main reasons. Firstly, in the mirror, Sigma just beats Orisa, because Sigma can rock Orisa out of her spear spin. This means Orisa has to do an inefficient cycle of fortifying first, then spear spinning, which isn't great. Secondly, Orisa is really not great at marking and clearing angles. In those Saudi Arabia examples, all Orisa could try and do is spear spin the Arnonade and throw a javelin, but it's much harder for Orisa to mark multiple angles or heroes, unlike Sigma. Now into DPS variations. This one is very broad, so I'm gonna have to be quick with my coverage. Ash. Great against hard wall comps due to Dynamite and Bob, but due to her immobile nature, she's not great at absorbing dives. Bastion. He's pretty uncommon, but his main place is against Winston based dive comps. Saudi Arabia made this variation against China for that reason, which forced Gushui to go Doomfist. However, his cons are his massive hitbox, his underwhelming ultimates, and his cyclical nature, with his over-reliance on turret form to actually do anything. Cassidy. Biggest pro is the sustain. More HP, roll, and nade are all great defensive tools. The main con is suffering in any kind of poke mirror. He has no self-sustain and lacks the variety of damage that Sojin, Soldier, Ash, or Widow may have. He's also got a bad ultimate and no vertical mobility. Echo or Genji. If you're playing these heroes, you're probably not playing Poke Brawl, you're instead playing some Poke Dive variation. Their greater mobility, similar to Tracer, means they're able to directly control flanks and angles, but they just don't synergize well with Bapiliari, hence why most of their synergies are with Brig, Ana, Zen, Kiriko backlines. Junkrat. He occupies a very niche but equally important role as one of the best anti brawl characters in the game. He has insane AoE damage, he can kill people without needing direct LOS, and his tire can destroy brawl bunkers on a whim. The downside is that in other cases, he's really not great. He's a terrible duelist due to the over-reliance on the one-shots and loses map control very easily unless your name is Kaya. Mei. You might think Mei is a straight-up brawl hero, but she can be played in Pokeball hybrids. She thrives on trying to bunker and absorb dives, but loses value on more open maps where heroes with greater range or mobility can provide more to the team than her wall. Farah. Again, another poke dive variation that's often played with a Mercy Kiriko or a Mercy on a backline, but it does have its utility against sim based brawl comps. I've already explained the pros and cons of Farah in my dive guide, so refer to that for more details. Soldier. He'll mainly be a variation of a Sojourn. His biggest pros are his consistent damage and self-sustain, but his biggest cons are the lack of burst damage, lack of burst mobility, a terrible ultimate if you can already aim, and a lack of vertical mobility. He's best in ranked environments if your supports aren't going to help your off angle. Tracer. You might be a bit confused at this, because Tracer isn't a poke hero in any sense of the imagination. Well, the reasoning for playing Tracer is actually as a preventative anti-dive hero. If you're playing Zen Bap, you literally just mark the enemy flanker with Zen Orbs and you win every time. She helps poke teams maintain map control and is probably a must pick if you're playing Zen Bap or Zen Ana. Sadly, her biggest downside is that she doesn't synergize well with or do well against Ilari Bat backlines, hence why she wasn't one of the main DPS options in Section 1. Torb. Same pros and cons as Cassidy, but they're even more extreme on Torb. Very good as a variation against Dive, but that's about it. Widowmaker. She's decent in the mirror, as long as you're not playing against Sojourn and you're playing on an open, long sightline map. Against Dive, she fully plays for the prevent stage, which is a blessing and a curse, since she can't absorb dives nearly as well as other DPS heroes, she's super LOS based, and it's very situational based on the map. Now onto support variations. Q. 
Kiriko is the main one and is used in poke dive variations. She's best at enabling mobile DPS heroes like Genji or Tracer to help prevent dive heroes from staging or to straight up win in close range duels. Her downside is the lack of defensive peel or bunker ability alongside her very subpar and inconsistent range threats. On maps like Soko Royale where she can't flank or have close range duels due to their map geometry, it'd be way better to play purely poke heroes like Bap Zen or even Ana Zen. Speaking of Ana, she's up next. I see Ana poke variations the most in two scenarios. Firstly, against brawl comps, since Honor Nade is great against clumped up teams, and secondly, with pharmacy teams, since Nanofara is a strong win condition, and she has quite the bit of healing power. Barring that though, her lack of mobility and sustain holds her back compared to Baptiste. Honor in poke can get ran over relatively easily, and isn't great into brawl dive hybrids like Winston Lucio Kiri comps. After Honor is Brig. Again, Brig doesn't have any poke, but she's played in poke comps to help strengthen the comp against dive. As a result, she's great against dive, but in mirrors, where the enemy team are playing Iliari Bap or more ranged backlines, she can struggle to close the distance and actually do anything. Next is Mercy Zen. Again, similar to the dive section, they're great against the brawl based comps, where you can be as greedy as you like. But against Dive, similar to Widow, you're really just playing for the prevent stage because any backline that has a Mercy, Zen, or God forbid both, really struggle at absorbing dives. Now to the map chops, starting with Brawl. Brawl teams are usually made up of Ryan, Lucio, Bap, with Symmetra, May, or Sojourn being the primary DPS lineup and Ramatra being a variation too. The Brawl win condition is simple, close the range in some kind of way, whether that's by bunkering or forcing points, quickly overloading one of your cores with a numbers advantage or still mating and matching your cores on defense. Your win condition is to split into a 3 man and a 2 man core. Whichever core that rush comp decides to overload, that core needs to pull back and live and the other core needs to push back, either chasing the tail of that rush comp's backline as I spoke about before or directly helping out their core that's getting pushed. Again, I recommend checking out section 2 where I go over a lot of that macro. Moving on to the brawl dive matchup, which usually consists of some kind of Queen Genji Lucio comp, but also includes Zarya and Arisa variations, your win condition is still somewhat similar to the brawl matchup. They want to get their Arisa or their Queen and their Genji on top of your backline in close range. Meanwhile, you want to either prevent that from happening, absorb it if it does, and repush after their Genji is out. I recommend watching the brawl dive section of my brawl guide, where there's a ton of good examples that still apply to the Puck brawl comp. For example, on Lijan Control Center, it'd be fairly normal for your Sojin Eliari to take White Room and your other core to stay main. Hopefully, the Sojin Eliari can get some off angle value early on, but if that's not the case, you can just power slide and outburst away, absorb the cycle from the enemy brawl dive comp, then re push while the dive team are on their downtime. Here's actually an example from my own team, Work Angels, which you can see me coach live on Twitch, link down below. The main difference is that they're running re put over Genji, but same advice still applies. Firstly, our Sojin should be with our Honor instead of the Genji. This way, we just disrupt the shot of the Reaper TP, we pre-fire at his head, making it a lot easier to absorb the dive pressure from the Reaper and force out his Wraith. Secondly, our Kiriko should be looking to help peel for our Honor first, then look to re-push on the enemy team. I spoke about this in my dive guide and why trading backlines can get messy, but if our Honor still dies with Kiriko help, then we can look for trades. Thirdly, our Doom Genji should be zoning out the Bat Mei. Unless the Baptiste Mei are rushing with the Orisa Reaper, which they aren't, there's no reason to force out a trade. Just absorb the dive pressure and repush the enemy team on their downtime. Our Genji could also be helping the peel, it just depends on what's easier to do. Again, if the Bat Mei do rush with the Orisa Reaper, we just chase that tail as spoke about prior. Now on to dive. I'll just put a screenshot of China's dive comp since it's convenient to follow and it means less editing for me. Thankfully, I've already explained a lot of the dive macro beforehand, so I recommend going to sections 2E, 2F and 2G for more specific details and examples. In short, just follow the spa framework which I've already made a separate video on. Prevent the dive with range and angles, absorb the dive with cooldowns, ultimates and by bunkering and then repush the dive when they're on their back foot. There's this textbook example I used in my dive guide with Houston diving into Florida, but let's talk about what Florida could have done better here. Firstly, let's talk about the prevent stage. I would have liked to see Florida overload the right side and flush out Happy Soldier while Larissa is forcing points. Then they can either catch out Happy with a visor or they can catch out Pelican if he decides to rotate where Florida once held. 
As long as Happy or Pelican are out of the fight, absorbing the dive should become a lot easier. Someone actually wastes his Terra Surge, which he could use to zone off some area of the dive, and there's also a lot of cover on the right side, making it easier for Florida to bunker and absorb the dive. Then, Rupal can pop Matrix during that repush phase. Now onto the Poke Dive versus Poke Brawl matchup. I actually already have a VOD of me going over this exact matchup, so I'm gonna play the relevant parts. The differences is with the Brawl, these guys can actually hold space a lot more effectively and for a lot longer period of time than this combo over here. Obviously, Doom Vist is not great at holding space compared to Sigma. The benefit with Dive, with this uh, Dive Aviation, is we can take space a lot more quickly. We have access to a lot more of the map. Obviously, I mean, this is a good example, right? Element's already on high on here and it's been 20 seconds. So we can actually stage dives way more effectively. The second thing, push ball stuff. But because both comps are split comps, there'll be two cores most of the time. And then one of the cores is going to push and then the other core is going to pull. And we don't do this quite well. Again, we, their core cut in this direction. We pushed this way. And then they're gonna, they're gonna push back onto us as you'll see, which means we need to pull back. And then I'll just keep the arrows and We get a good push, we get a good push there, but we don't pull. Finally, onto the poke matchup. This is actually pretty simple. Just look to play short sight lines, either with how the map geometry is, as you can see with the May example on Circle Royale in the background, but also by bunkering and forcing points to force the poke team to come closer, which again is something that I've already talked about in the bunker section. Anyways, that's it for the video. Now onto the hybrid section. Now if you don't know what hybrids are, they're essentially mixtures of the three comp archetypes of Poke, Brawl and Dive. I can't cover every single possible comp that's been played, and frankly, I've already gone over how to play some of the hybrids in each of the matchup sections, but this should give an overview of how to play those variations that I didn't give that much time. Starting with the Zarya Reaper, or Zarya Genji, or Zarya Bastion Brawl Dive hybrids. The Zarya Brawl Dive comp features Zarya, obviously, Reaper, or more recently, Genji, any other DPS, but usually a Sojin, Bastion, or Mei, and a Lucio, Ana, or Baptiste. The Zarya comp win condition is fairly simple. Juggle aggression with one of your other DPS by bubbling their aggression. This will usually be a Reaper walking or teleporting in, a Genji walking or dashing in, or a Bastion popping turret form and rolling in. Then, get your Zarya to high charge in the mid fight and keep her alive to melt down the enemy team. The strength of the Zarya Brawl Dive hybrid is that it's simple. This might seem trivial, but the actual setup of the Zarya comp and what you're trying to do is a lot more straightforward compared to most dive comps out there. Another strength is that it's pretty good into most of Risa comps, and even against some Jungle Queen comps too. A Zarya bubbling a Bastion down main with speed boost can create a lot of space. This is something Coffee's team did back in the Orisa meta, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, since this is around half a year old, and not insanely complex, but you can seriously chunk a lot of space initially with this comp. Another strength is that it's not one dimensional. You can swap out the flex support and the DPS to help fit the map or to fit the enemy comp that you're playing against. For example, Zarya, Lucio, Ana, Genji, Hanzo probably isn't that great into Winston 5 man comps. However, a Zarya, Lucio, Moira, Bastion, Reaper comp looks quite a bit better. Your Reaper doesn't even need to TP, he just walks forward and then your Zarya's gonna bubble him. However, this comp definitely has its weaknesses. Firstly, and most importantly, Zarya is the squishiest ground tank in the game. You will probably lose to Ryan or Amartra based brawl comps a fuck ton of the time because you are not surviving a good Maywall cycle, regardless of how much aggro you juggle. The second issue is that it's actually quite map based. On more open maps, it's relatively easy for you to go in and for your team to get poked out, and say you want to bubble your Genji to go in, but he's just too far away, or they're running Iliari and she just outbursts away, or maybe your Genji just gets his deflect forced out early, or maybe he gets chunked to half HP before you actually go in. Bubble cycles aren't always a reliable win condition. Now onto a poke brawl variation. Now I know my poke guide is technically a poke brawl guide, but this one is a special variation. It's Sigma, Mei, Symmetra, Torb, or even Junkrat, finished off with Brig, or Kiriko, and Baptiste. This, as you may intuitively already know, is the ultimate anti-dive comp. But why is that? Well, if we look at my spa framework, 
which is used to beat dive teams, we see that this comp mainly plays for the absorb stage. For those who don't know the framework, the prevent stage just means how much you can poke up the enemy dive comp when they're busy staging, the absorb stage refers to how well you can actually survive their dive, and the rotate stage refers to how well you can move up after the dive has, well, dove, and whether you can keep the dive on their back foot. Of course, if you're running Hog, he's going to be better in the prevent stage because he can fish for hooks and prevent the enemy staging with his hook. For example, maybe he lands a hook onto a tracer, but the trade back is that he's slightly worse than the absorb stage because you haven't got that sigma shield to block off things like sojourn shots or arna nades. The biggest strength of this comp has to be the sustain, or at least the ability to bunker. Especially with the season 9 patch coming in, even if you have ultimates, which charge 10% slower by the way, this comp has a lot of tools to absorb and mitigate the effectiveness of something like a nanoblade or an EMP nanodive. Not to mention, this comp still has quite a bit of range. May spam, torp spam, sim spam, bap spam is quite underrated. The biggest weakness with this comp though is the mobility. On big open maps where you need to be able to spread out and control the flanks, or if you're playing against a Ryan based May Brawl comp, you're gonna encounter some trouble. Brick against Brawl is especially not very good. And lastly, onto the poke dive variation, Pharmacy. Now I know Far is getting a rework very soon, according to the Rupal leaks, so I'll keep this one short, but hopefully the fundamentals stay the same. This is usually some kind of poke dive variation, but unlike most poke dive variations, it comes with its own unique set of strengths and weaknesses. Let's start with how you fundamentally play the comp and the heroes that it features. Most top level Farah teams play D.Va, Farah and Mercy of course, paired with a Tracer and a Kiriko or an Ana, depending on the map and when the enemy team are running. The primary win condition of Pharmacy is dumping resources into your Farah to help her control angles and spam out the enemy team from range. Once you have some kind of advantage, your Farah can then hard commit or hard dive with concussive blast to blow up the enemy team. The strengths of this comp are the AoE damage, the fact that it solves the point presence issue that poke dive comps often struggle with thanks to the diva pick, and Nano Barrage or Nano Farah is a solid win condition. It's also a classic answer to Symmetra Brawl comps because Pharmacy can literally off angle from anywhere, making this a good counter to how Brawl comps want to bunker. The biggest issue with this comp is its map dependence. If the map has a lot of open space, which makes it hard for Farah to rotate from cover to cover, good luck running this comp. Farah Tracer are also notoriously weak against Cassidy, and if that Cassidy has space or range, you might be cooked. Your team also needs to have great individual micro. Your Farah needs to be hitting directs, and needs to have great cover usage. Your Tracer needs to be playing in your Arna's OS, or at least being wary of where her Kiriko is. Your D.Va can't eat that much damage in the pre-fight, or waste too much DM, or get a booster's full style early, otherwise you're going to lose a lot of space. And that can affect how much your pharmacy can do. So that's pretty much it for the hybrid section. I think in this new patch where everyone gets big sustain buffs, Zen Brig might make a comeback, but we'll see. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed, and be sure to share this around because, as you might have guessed, this took a lot of bloody time. That's it for now, stay tuned for my map guides, and until next time.